Now to today's session, the psychology of disagreement, how leaders can navigate polarized conversations hosted by Julia Minson. Julia Minson is an associate professor of public policy here at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is a decision scientist with research interests in conflict, negotiations, and judgment making. Her primary line of research addresses the psychology of disagreement. How do people engage with opinions, judgments, and decisions that are different from their own? Much of Julia's research is conducted in collaboration with the graduate and postdoctoral members of MC Squared, the Minson Conflict and Collaboration Lab. At the Kennedy School, Julia is affiliated with the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and the Center for Public Leadership. She teaches courses on negotiations and decision-making as part of the management leadership and decision, decision science area, as well as through HKS Executive Education. Julia is the organizer of the Leadership, Influence, and Decision-Making Speaker Series sponsored by the Center for Public Leadership and the Management Leadership and Decision Sciences area. Julia, thank you so much for joining us today on this important topic. Over to you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you everyone for joining me here today. Um, so the work I want to talk about uh, addresses the question that has animated most of my research throughout the years. And it is the question of how can people thoughtfully engage with each other when their attitudes, their beliefs, uh, their fundamental values are in conflict. Uh, we can sort of argue that the very fabric of democracy is framed before our eyes. And one reason for that is that people have such a difficult time engaging with opposing perspectives in a thoughtful, reasonable manner. Um, a lot of my research has dealt with trying to define and measure uh, what does it mean to be receptive to opposing views? So we have defined receptiveness as the willingness to access, consider, and evaluate supporting and opposing views in a relatively impartial manner. And it's worth thinking about that definition for a second. So what we're saying here is that for a person to count as being receptive, they really have to engage with the information at every stage of information processing. They have to access it, they have to consider it, and they have to evaluate it. So in other words, if you are, for example, a conservative and you're watching President Joe Biden's State of the Union address, but the entire time you're thinking about all the things you hate about the address and looking for sort of holes in the president's argument, you're not being receptive, right? Being receptive really means being physically present, but also thoroughly considering the information and evaluating it in a relatively impartial manner. Now, that's really, really hard. In fact, for most people, it's nearly impossible. And so that's why the wording we choose is a relatively impartial, not completely unbiased, right? We're looking for people who are a little bit less in support of their side over the other side. Now, the other thing that's important to notice about the definition is what is not here. What is not in this definition is any mention of compromise or attitude change. So when we talk about receptiveness, what we really mean is thoughtfully engaging with the other side and trying to understand their perspective. We don't mean necessarily being persuaded by their arguments. Now, based on uh, our thinking and some prior theorizing, we have come up with a way to measure receptiveness in people. So this is uh, a questionnaire scale we developed and published uh, a couple of years ago that consists of 18 items that all fall on this strongly agree to strongly disagree scale. Um, and you know it takes about five minutes to take the scale and it really allows us to understand who is receptive and also what situations can increase receptiveness. And in line with our uh, theorizing, what we find is that people who are higher on the scale process information differently. So one of the things we know is that, for example, when we do studies where we expose participants to choices of reading material, for example, they will be in a study where we say, later on, you're going to have to read the web pages of prominent US senators Whose web pages would you like to read? 
people on average strongly favor reading the web pages of the senators from their own side. However, people who are higher in self-reported receptiveness are more likely to consume sort of a balanced set of information by choosing websites from their own side, but also websites from the other side. We know that people who are more receptive are better at maintaining attention to content that they disagree with. So the way we do th these studies is imagine that you had to listen to a long speech uh, about new legislation. Now, imagine you listen to the speech coming from Senator Bernie Sanders, right? You're listening to him making a 10 minute long uh, Senate floor speech about uh, the Affordable Care Act, or you're listening to a speech on the same topic, also a floor speech, but now it's coming from Senator Mitch McConnell. Most people tend to tune out when they listen to political speeches at some point. Uh, and we also tend to tune out even more when we're listening to the side we don't agree with. However, people who are more receptive, again, are better at maintaining their attention to both sides of the argument. And then finally, when we ask them to evaluate the quality of the arguments, right, do you think the people who offer these types of arguments are reasonable, rational, moral, intelligent, they evaluate sort of the proponents of both sides more even-handedly. Uh, what we've also found is that receptiveness is fairly stable over time. So we can measure a person's receptiveness uh, at one point, and then it predicts their behavior uh, several months later and also predicts behavior outside of the lab. So we think this is a really useful measure that can be used in a lot of different settings. Um, and so we built a website, um, receptiveness.net, that allows us to really sort of spread this information. If you would like, you can go on receptiveness.net even right now if you want to. Um, and actually measure your own receptiveness. So there is a button here that says, take the quiz. Uh, you can measure your receptiveness. You can send it around your office. You can send it around your family uh, and find out how receptive everyone is uh, and really start a conversation about what is it that prevents people from being more receptive to opposing views. Now, having figured out what receptiveness is and how to measure it, what we were really interested in was how does it play out in actual disagreements? Um, and so here we actually collaborated with a program that's part of the Kennedy School Executive Education um, where I teach uh, almost every year. Uh, and what we did is we recruited participants in the program to help us in our research. Uh, so this is a large group now of state and local government leaders. And when they first arrived to the program, we asked them to tell us about how receptive they are. We asked them to fill out our questionnaire. And then we also asked their attitudes on a bunch of really controversial hot button issues. Now on day two of the program, they engaged in an online conversation with somebody else in their group. So we paired these participants based on disagreement on those attitudes they filled out on day one, right? So you were paired up with somebody you disagree with and they engaged in a 20 minute long online chat. So you're sitting in a cubicle, You've got a computer in front of you. The cubicle is private. You don't know who you're talking to. So people were pretty honest in their views and opinions on these topics. And what we wanted to see was, do people who are receptive communicate differently when they disagree on an important topic, right? Can we pick up something in their behavior that kind of mimics their different information processing style? So at the end of the chat, we had participants rate how receptive they thought they were in this conversation and also how receptive they thought their partner was in the conversation. We also asked them to rate their partner on a bunch of dimensions having to do with how much do you want to work with this person in the future, right? Do you want this person on your team? Do you think this person is trustworthy? Do you think they have good judgment? Now, here is what we find. 
On one hand, what we find is that receptiveness, when it's perceived by your counterpart, is great. So what we see here on the bottom of the graph, on the x-axis, is perceptions of partner receptiveness. If I rate you as being more receptive, I'm much more interested in working with you in the future. So perceptions of receptiveness seem to be a benefit. But also, these data left us with a mystery, which is we don't actually know what people are picking up on when they say that somebody seems receptive, right? Like what are perceptions of receptiveness based on? What are people kind of saying in these chats that make them seem as if they are receptive? The other thing that was really surprising though was that there was a very loose correlation between self-rated receptiveness and partner-rated receptiveness. In other words, people who said they were receptive, according to our scale, were not seen as receptive by their counterparts. And so either our scale is broken, which we know it's not because we've tested it in lots of studies where it does actually predict behavior, or something is broken about how people express themselves when they are communicating with somebody they strongly disagree with. And so this is then what we set out to study in the next uh, part of this project. The way we set out to study this question is by using natural language processing. Now, I am a uh, psychologist. I am not a computational linguist, but I learned a lot about kind of the basics of computational linguistics through doing this kind of work. So the first thing we did was we collected hundreds of conversations between people who disagree with each other on controversial topics by basically pairing people up online and asking them to debate a particular topic. We have all of these conversations in the form of text. And so then we get another now massive group of people. This is thousands of people now. And we ask them to read these conversations from step one and evaluate how receptive do the people in those initial conversations seem. Okay. So now we have the actual text and we have how receptive do the people who wrote that text appear to sort of impartial third-party observers? And then in step three, what we do is train a machine learning algorithm to pick out the words and phrases that people say that are correlated with ratings of receptiveness. So what are the specific little bits of language that make somebody seem more or less receptive? Now, this all seems probably super abstract, so I'm going to try to make it much more concrete. We're going to play a game called pretend you are an algorithm, okay? For this game, I'm going to show you two pieces of text from our study. These two pieces of text were both written by people who are responding to the same point, okay? The prompt has to do with interactions between police officers and minority suspects. Uh, so it's related to the Black Lives Matter movement. And the two people who wrote the statements I'm going to show you agree with each other. And they both disagree with the person they're responding to. But their communication style is very different. And so what I want you to do is I want you to read the two pieces of text and decide which one of them is more receptive. When you decide, I want you to put your vote in the chat. Okay, so if you think the first piece of text is more receptive, put a one in the chat. And if you think the second piece of text is more receptive, put a two in the chat. So here we go. All right, so 
everybody sees the chat, there is an overwhelming consensus that the first piece of text is the more receptive piece of text. And in fact, I made our job fairly easy here by cherry picking uh, from our data. So the first piece of text is the one of the most receptive uh, pieces of text in our data. Uh, and the second is one of the least receptive pieces of text in our data. And when we look at them, we all have the sense of, yeah, the first one feels different than the second one, but what is that sense based on, right? Imagine you had to go and explain to somebody how to be receptive. It is not at all obvious what are sort of the key features of language that give us that impression that the first one is somehow different than the second one. And so what the algorithm does is it specifically picks out the relevant language. So the algorithm produces a graph that looks like this. On the vertical axis are features of language and on the horizontal axis is how frequently they are used. We can look at pieces of text that are analyzed by human coders where the blue pieces of text are what humans thought was more receptive and the red pieces of text are what humans thought was less receptive. And so we see that there are specific features of language that are used with different frequency in more versus recept less receptive text. And when we look at our specific example that I showed you, those two blurbs, they are differentiated by these five features. So negation is things like can't, don't, no, won't. Reasoning words, I saw somebody in the chat say that the, second, um, that the second blurb is more analytical, and that's exactly right. So reasoning words are things like because and therefore and although, right? They make you sound smart, but also incredibly condescending. Acknowledgement is essentially showing with your words that you heard your partner's perspective. So the idea behind acknowledgement is that before we launch into our own argument, we say something like, I understand you are saying X, Y, Z, or I hear that A, B, C is really important to you. It's using some of your own airtime to restate your partner's point of view. Hedges are things like sometimes, occasionally, some people. It's the idea that any claim you're making is not absolute and you realize that there are exceptions to every rule. And then of course, agreement is saying things like, I agree that something, something, or we both want a world where people are treated with respect, right? It's finding areas of agreement and consensus, even if you happen to powerfully disagree on the focal issue. So if we go back to our two blurbs, uh, here are the differences highlighted. I understand is acknowledgement, probably is a hedge. I can also see is acknowledgement. I agree is agreement and possibly sometimes is a hedge. Whereas if you look at the second blurb, uh, do not and can't are negations and therefore because and because are all reasoning words. So what we've learned through doing this type of work is that this style of communication that we're now calling conversational receptiveness is made up of these very specific words and phrases that make people feel heard in communication. Using conversational receptiveness strongly predicts conflict outcomes. So when people evaluate conflict counterparts, we can predict their evaluations and their willingness to interact with this person in the future, uh, and even whether the conflict will sort of devolve into name calling from whether people are more receptive in their speech. We also know that the algorithmic measure we developed uh, is well correlated with human ratings of receptiveness. And so as a result, we can now take large bodies of text and process them through the algorithm to measure how receptive uh, different pieces of text are, right? So if we're measuring conversations or if we are scraping large amounts of text from the internet, uh, we can use the algorithm to measure receptiveness. 
Now, from our follow-up research, one of the things we figured out is that the reason that our executive education participants showed that difference between feeling receptive and acting receptive is that when people think they're being receptive, they often use politeness and formality instead of engagement. So basically when you tell people to be receptive but don't tell them how to do it, they use the wrong words. They say things like sir and ma'am and please. They don't actively engage with the other person's point of view. By contrast, when we train people to use conversational receptiveness by teaching them the specific words and phrases, it's very easy for them to pick it up, right? This is a simple, limited set of conversational cues that can be easily incorporated into our speech. Furthermore, we found that conversational receptiveness is actually more persuasive than using straight argumentation. So we might think of it as being sort of softer and perhaps sounding less confident, but we find that people who are on the receiving end are more likely to change their mind. And finally, and perhaps most excitingly to me right now, is that conversational receptiveness is imitated. So we are often sort of thinking about how can I make this person listen to me? Well, it turns out that the way you make them listen to you is by first listening to them. Um, we have been doing a lot of work trying to take this research sort of out into the world and made it accessible and usable to folks. Uh, including students at the Kennedy School, um, including um, conversations like this one. Uh, and in order to help people remember how to do conversational receptiveness, we came up with an, uh, with an acronym uh, called HEAR, as in I hear you. So the H in HEAR stands for hedging your claims. And you can hedge your claims using phrases such as, I think it's possible that this might happen because, or some people tend to think. Uh, the E stands for emphasizing agreement. I think we both want to, or I agree with some of what you're saying, or we are both concerned with. Acknowledging other perspectives. I understand that. I see your point. What I think you are saying is. Uh, and the R is reframing to the positive. So using positive terms like I think it's great when, or I really appreciate it when, or it would be so wonderful if, right? So the idea behind the R is that anything you have to say can be said in positive terms or negative terms. And again, because receptiveness tends to be mimicked and reciprocated, if you set a positive tone, it will likely be picked up by your brain. Now, in ongoing work, we are trying to see if we can use conversational receptiveness to intervene in some common situations where people really have to engage with perspectives they might not like. So uh, we have been using uh, this set of tools to run studies on uh, communication around the COVID-19 vaccine. Part of the idea here is that a challenge that many medical professionals face, right, is that they need to change patient beliefs and attitudes, right? They need to get them to take a vaccine or they need to get them to take a medication or they need them to, you know, quit smoking. And they have very limited time per patient, right? Anyone who's been to the doctor recently knows that doctors are sort of incredibly overwhelmed with their workload. Furthermore, doctors get very, very little training for the task of persuasion. And the training they get is mostly not evidence-based. On the patient side, we also know from a lot of medical communication research that many patients trust their doctors above and beyond any other source of available medical information. So it seems like this would be a great opportunity to intervene. And patients need to maintain an ongoing relationship with their doctors, even if at some point they don't want to comply with the recommendation, right? So there's sort of this awkward moment where you have to come back the next time and say, no, doctor, I didn't get the vaccine or no, doctor, I haven't been taking the pill. Uh, 
So the way we've approached this problem is by conducting experiments where we recruit participants and screen them for being either strongly for the COVID-19 vaccine or being vaccine hesitant. And then we put them in a chat room together and we let them have a conversation about the vaccine. Before putting them into this chat room, we ask the pro-vaccine participants to think about how they will approach the conversation. We randomly assign them to a group that's asked to be as persuasive as possible and think through their arguments that they will make to try to convince the other person to get vaccinated. Or we teach them about the conversational receptiveness cues that I just showed you and say, use these cues in your argument and try to be as persuasive as possible. At the end of the conversation, we ask vaccine hesitant participants to answer a series of questions about what they thought about the person they talked to, what they thought about the messages that they received, and most importantly, whether they're willing to consume more information uh, about the vaccines. And so indeed what we find is that conversational receptiveness helps people have these conversations more productively. Right. Even though these are perfect strangers on the Internet and these are all lay people, none of them are doctors. Right. People who are vaccine hesitant evaluate their counterpart more positively and are more willing to talk to them about other topics when that counterpart received three minutes worth of training and conversational receptiveness. And then at the end of this study, a really important measure we have is saying okay, here are some websites with some additional information about the vaccine. Please feel free to click on these and learn more. And we find that vaccine hesitant patients who received uh, a conversational receptiveness intervention were more likely to click on that accurate information, including uh, the websites for how to sign up for vaccine in their area. Um, this work, of course, calls for a field study, right? We need real doctors, we need real patients, we need to measure real vaccine uptake. So if anybody out there among the thousand of you that's joined me today uh, wants to partner on field research, please email me after the talk. Um, but this is the direction, this is the direction that we're going, trying to figure out how we can really leverage this work uh, to improve some of the most difficult conversations that people are having. All right, so I would love to take some questions from uh, the Q&A section. I understand uh, there's a lot in there. Um, here is my email. Uh, there's also the website with uh, the rest of the research. And for those of you who've been asking about uh, where to take the receptiveness questionnaire. It's receptiveness.net. Thank you, Julia. We do have quite a few questions in the Q&A. So there's a few around gender. Um, have you noticed any differences in receptive, receptiveness as related to different genders? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. So we kind of have to separate it now, right, into cognitive receptiveness versus conversational receptiveness. So cognitive receptiveness, the way people process information, we have not seen any gender differences. So, you know, I think the best way to put it is that women are just as unreceptive in their heads as men are. However, conversational receptiveness is different. So women, tend to naturally be more receptive in their speech than men are. Uh, and this is like a pretty big effect size. Uh, so women are by far more receptive than men are uh, in their speech without any training. Now, one interesting follow-up to that finding that people often bring up is, well, isn't there sort of a risk to that or isn't that sort of bad news for women because conversational receptiveness involves, you know, all these hedging statements and we're always telling women to be more confident and more assertive and isn't this like a bad thing? Um, and so we have actually been studying 
uh, the reputational consequences of conversational receptiveness, right? If I am a leader and I communicate in a receptive manner with somebody who might be saying, you know, bad, untrue things, is that going to make me come off as a poor leader? Um, and in fact, we find the opposite. We find that conversational receptiveness is very well received by third party observers, um, either third party observers who sort of agree with you in the first place or third party observers who agree with the person that you disagree with that you're being receptive to. Um, so, so the leadership implications uh, seem to be largely positive. Great. Um, and does receptiveness vary across cultures? Ah, that's an excellent, excellent question. I don't have an answer. And part of the reason I don't have an answer is because, uh, of course, to measure receptiveness across cultures, we have to translate both the scale and the algorithm into different languages uh, and find participants in other cultures who would be willing to uh, take part in the research. So if you are the sort of person who would like to do that work, again, please email me. Okay, another question. Could receptive language predict or is, or is it correlated to agreement at all? Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. So there is this interesting wrinkle, right? Which is where, when we, tell people how to be receptive, presumably we haven't changed their attitude, right? So there's sort of this like enacting receptive language because they've been taught to do it, which is different than enacting receptive language because you are naturally the kind of person that speaks in this way. Um, I would say that when you are, when you strongly disagree with somebody and, you know, everybody can sort of introspect about this experience and have this feeling, it's much harder to be receptive, right? So when you really think the other person is promoting false information or dangerous information or hurtful information, it is hard to be receptive to them, even if you know that it will ultimately make the conversation go better. Uh, with milder disagreement, it's easier. Um, we also know that cognitive receptiveness in terms of information processing is correlated with people having more, more moderate views, right? So people who are sort of like less politically extreme, for example, tend to be more receptive. Uh, and we don't know which is sort of the chicken or the egg, right? Because you could imagine that if you're a moderate, you're more receptive, or it could be being more receptive is how you became a moderate, right? Uh, and of course, both of those things kind of reinforce each other because being more receptive makes you more willing to hear both sides of the issue. Hearing both sides of the issue is likely to make you more moderate, right? Um, so they're certainly related. Um, sort of statistically speaking, we can still, we can control for how extreme somebody's view is and still see that their receptiveness predicts the way they consume information. Thank you. Um, what can change cognitive receptiveness? Ah, yes, that's the million dollar question. Um, so cognitive receptiveness is shockingly hard to change. And when I say shockingly hard to change, I mean shockingly hard to change upwards in interesting ways, right? Making people cognitively unreceptive is pretty easy, right? And a lot of it is not very interesting, right? So confronting people with you know, strong arguments for like morally abhorrent views will make them less receptive. But that, that I'm sure not what the speaker is actually asking for uh, or what, what, the, what the audience member is asking for. Uh, making people cognitively more receptive is something we spend uh, quite a lot of time 
trying to figure out. Uh, and we have kind of a glimpse of hope uh, in some recent research we've done looking at, again, sort of the reciprocal nature of receptiveness. Um, so one of the things we found is that because people so powerfully react to feeling heard, when you believe that your counterpart is truly interested in learning about your perspective, it actually makes you more receptive. So there's this really interesting wrinkle, which is again, if you want your counterpart to be more receptive to you, and now we're talking about cognitive receptiveness, not conversational receptiveness, you need to communicate to them that you're truly interested in their perspective. Um, and you know, of all the of all the studies we've done on this topic, that's the one that seems to actually move the needle is making people feel like their counterparts are actually interested um, in, in, in what they have to say. Have you found that receptiveness varies across topics? For example, politics, religion, whatever it may be. Yeah, you know, so yes. So it's a very, um, two levels to that question. So it certainly varies, you know, in terms of sort of attitude strength, right? So, you know, if I like this kind of shampoo and my kids like the other kind of shampoo, uh, you know, we're not going to get a whole lot of conflict or unreceptiveness. Although anyone who has teenage kids might disagree, like you can fight about shampoo with teenagers, but you know, most adults won't fight about shampoo, right? Um, topics that are beliefs that we hold more strongly invite less receptiveness. But, you know, some people feel very strongly about things that aren't particularly consequential. So it gets, it gets messy fast. What we have started thinking about, and this is a, a new paper that I uh, co-wrote with my former student, Charlie Dorison, who is now at uh, postdoc at Kellogg, we thought through kind of a framework of what are the issues that drive unreceptiveness. And what we really arrived at is that issues where people really have trouble being receptive have three features. The one feature is importance, right? Is it important to me that you hold the same belief as I do, right? So it's important to me that you recognize that COVID is a big problem in a way that's different than, you know, it's important to me that you recognize that flossing is important, right? Like flossing is important, sure, but it's not on the same scale, right? So importance is one. The other one is interdependence. In other words, if you continue believing this thing that I disagree with, does it affect me in any way, right? And so then you could imagine, you know, again, the COVID and the flossing example works because you think about, well, if you don't get vaccinated, you could infect me. So I care about your vaccination status, whereas I don't care about your kidneys. But then you could take away importance, right? And say, look, if we're going out to dinner together, I care about where you want to go to dinner because I have to go with you. Right? So even though this is not an important thing, we're still interdependent. And so interdependent makes me care about your beliefs. And then the third piece is what we call evidentiary balance. So I have a belief and you have a belief and both of us think we have evidence for our beliefs, right? To what extent do I think the evidence is totally skewed in my favor, right? So you could imagine situations where we say, look, this is really confusing. This is a very hard situation. So I believe we should do X and you believe we should do Y, but I recognize that the evidence is fairly balanced. Or you could say, look, this is a matter of taste. I prefer dark chocolate and you prefer milk chocolate. And there's no evidence on anybody's side because this is about preferences, not about facts. But there are some cases 
where there's overwhelming evidence on one side. And of course, when both sides think that they have overwhelming evidence, that's when you get into real problems. So it's those three things. It's importance, interdependence, and feeling like you have all the evidence on your side that really draw on this happiness. Okay, thank you. Um, two questions sort of along the same lines. Should we take into consideration the power distance? The one with more power should dial, receptive, dial receptiveness language up to provide psychological safety for the other to speak up? And along that, those lines, what is the relationship between trust and the level of receptiveness between people? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So the, the power comment, I think, is right on, right? So uh, if you are, imagine if you are in a disagreement at work, for example, it's your boss, right? You can imagine that the person in the lower status position is already working overtime to try to show their receptiveness, right? Um, and it's, you know, receptiveness often takes a little bit more work, right? It takes more words. Uh, and quite often people in the position, in a position of power sort of can't be bothered, right? Because they don't need to be. Uh, and so to the extent that you really want to create a culture of receptiveness in an organization, uh, it's a very, very good idea to have people who don't need to do it, but who uh, really sort of capture the attention of everybody else in the organizational hierarchy to lead with example, right? Uh, people who are at the top of organizational hierarchies tend to draw attention from everybody else. Uh, and so you really have the opportunity to shape uh, a culture if you use one style of communication or another style of communication. Um, so I think I think that's um, I think that's tremendously important. Um, and you know the question of trust. I think question of trust is really important as well, in the sense that you know there's sort of different types of trust that researchers talk about. Um, and I think what this questioner is really asking about is, do I trust that you have good intentions towards me? Do I trust that you are like an ethical person who happens to disagree with me, but probably has good reasons for doing so, right? So that's a different type of trust than saying, I think that you're a competent person who is good at their job but you know, happens to be sort of a selfish jerk, right? So if we're talking about trust in your integrity and trust in your kind of benevolent intentions towards me, yes, that's very important. And part of what happens is trust is one of the things that's quickly eroded with disagreement, right? So when you disagree with me, I very quickly attribute that disagreement to the fact that you are a, a bad person who has negative intentions, who has limited intelligence, who is kind of biased by their own selfish motives. Uh, and so that deteriorates uh, in conflict. Um, and to the extent that you can demonstrate conversational receptiveness and really think about kind of in a fair-minded way of where is that person coming from, um, that can work towards rebuilding the trust as long. Thank you. So it seems like we have quite a few lawyers in the group here. And some are <laughs> wondering, have you researched certain professions that are dependent on persuasion, such as lawyers and judges, and their success as related to conversational receptiveness? Oh, that's interesting. I have not done lawyers and judges. <laughs> um, like I said, right now, we're working hard on finding doctors. Um, I, think, I think that's, I think that's a Fascinating question. Uh, I've done some studies with lawyers, uh, not on conversational receptiveness though. I found that, uh, you know, professionals in sort of all kinds of high demand fields are pretty hard to get into the lab. So, you know, people, people tend to have like real jobs that they're busy doing. Um, 
But again, if you work at a large law firm and you want to do research, uh, my email is right there. Okay. How would you describe the value proposition for being more receptive, particularly in the political sphere? Is there research that shows that it makes a person more persuasive or leads to better conflict resolution? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is, I think this is great. So our own research shows that it makes you more persuasive and does lead to better conflict resolution. Um, now, when we are when in the studies that we've done, we are really looking at sort of one-on-one -on -one interaction, right? So it's me sitting across the table from somebody I disagree with. Uh, and we find lots of evidence that that conversation goes more positively. It's less likely to devolve into conflict. It's less likely to devolve into name calling. The other person wants to talk to me in the future. They think I'm smarter, better, all kinds of things. So. No doubt, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, this is sort of the better way to go than our kind of traditional, than our traditional approach. Um, one of the things I always get uh, in seminars and when I teach this uh, in my negotiation class is this question of, well, if I am in public office, and I'm receptive to somebody who is saying crazy things, isn't it going to cost me? Um, and I, you know, I can relate to that intuition. And so we've been uh, doing a lot of work trying to understand, is there sort of a cost to being receptive to things that are uh, really aversive? What we're finding, again, on average, is that when a leader responds with receptiveness rather than straight argumentation, they are rated more positively, even when they're responding to something that seems sort of really distasteful. Now, I would make two like really important caveats to that. Uh, if you are sort of like eager to put this into practice and you're worried about your own political career. Um, one really important caveat is that in our studies, what we do is have the leader strongly disagree with like the untrue or sort of negative view. And then in the receptive framing, we add receptive language around that disagreement. So it's very clear to an observer that the leader disagrees but they're also being sort of civil and engaging. So you wanna make sure that like the fact that you disagree with whatever it is you're disagreeing with is crystal clear. Um, because I think sometimes what people worry about is that receptiveness comes off as agreement. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that those two things are separate, right? You can disagree with somebody, but still say, I'm grateful for your engagement and I would like to hear more about where you're coming from. The other piece that I think is also, again, important to like keep in mind in the real world, especially the real world of Twitter and social media, is that you could be receptive and that helps you with people on average, right? On average, people think you are a better leader and you're a better human being and you're smarter and you're more civil, right? But then there's three people who say, oh my gosh, I can't believe Laura was just open to that crazy person who said this crazy thing. And then they tweet that sound bite and off we go, right? So I think the other caveat is it helps you on average, but watch out for outliers. Okay. Can being aware of the other's opinion in advance affect our level of receptiveness in the conversation? Ah, really nice. Okay, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, it'll certainly affect your level of receptiveness, right? The question is kind of in what way? So imagine, you know, imagine you walk into, you know, your 
going to see your family and you run into an old friend and somebody that you know very well and you think that they're like a smart, reasonable human being, right? And they say, oh no, I haven't gotten vaccinated because I don't want the vaccine to change my DNA. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> right? And so there's a piece of it where being on, being like caught off guard on the spot, right, is not great because part of what you want with conversational receptiveness, we're kind of like part of what it demands is calming down and using receptive language uh, intentionally, right? Not like flying off the handle, but saying, okay, let me sort of think about why a reasonable smart person might be thinking this and where would they have gotten this information? Um, so being caught off guard is not great but also going in knowing that you're going to severely disagree with this person. Um, often what that leads to is a lot of stereotyping of the person, right? So you say, well, you know, only completely crazy people can believe such crazy things. So this person must be dumb, right? Or they must be biased or they must be, you know, those like self-centered jerks who don't care about anybody else besides themselves, right? So thinking about it in advance is also not ideal. I mean, you know, so like ideal situation, right? Is that, you know, you're going into a disagreement but you put in a conscious effort to try to think, okay, why would a smart, reasonable, well-meaning human being disagree with me on this, right? Like let's assume for a second that other people who disagree are also smart, reasonable, and well-meaning what could they possibly be basing their thoughts on? Let me go and find out, right? And so then that mindset is more helpful going. Great, thank you. So what helps people engaging in very difficult conversations demonstrate practice, demonstrate or practice conversational receptiveness in the face of triggering behavior and language? Do you have any tips there? Yeah. Yeah, so the more I do this kind of work, the more I think of conversational receptiveness as a skill, right? Um, I think of it as a skill that's like defensive driving, you know, where 80% of the time we're driving down the highway and we're listening to the music and we're sort of like one hand on the wheel, not really paying attention, right? And then somebody swerves into the lane in front of us and you probably don't remember the things you learned in driver's ed when you were 16. You know, your reaction time is not great, right? You get like all this adrenaline and you like slam the brakes and then, you know, you're lucky if you sort of, you know, don't get into an accident. Conversational receptiveness is something that we need to be able to do reflexively. And so like waiting until you're in that conversation where somebody is being really triggering and really negative and you feel, you know, the physical symptoms of adrenaline, right? You're sort of your breath is fast and your heart is beating and you're turning red in the face. It's hard to think of the HEAR acronym in that situation and say, oh, what was that talk I heard <laughs> online a few months ago? How does that whole thing go? Right? So the thing that really helps is practice, right? Practicing conversational receptiveness in minor interactions, right? Like, you know, you are dealing with a customer service call that's sort of mildly unpleasant, right? Try to use that as an opportunity to work on your conversational receptiveness because it's a skill and a habit and the harder the situation is that you're in, the harder it is to deploy. Um, so a lot of um, one project that we're working on right now is trying to create an intervention for high school and college age students to practice conversational receptiveness in class over the course of several weeks to see if we can build it as 
nasty behavior that's just like habitual and easy and this is just how it rolls off your tongue um because i think practice is really where it's at thanks how important is nonverbal communication to understand the probability of receptiveness yeah yeah so nonverbal communication um is interesting because on one hand, I think people really strongly rely on nonverbal communication, both to um, signal their intentions and also to interpret other people's behavior. Like I think we're like a little bit in love with nonverbal communication uh, as a culture. Um, it's hard to study because it's so multidimensional, right? Uh, it's harder to write algorithms where you, you know, video record people and like, you know, code their body lean and code their nodding and code their smiling. There's, there's a lot to it. Um, one of the things that I would say is that certainly it should go along with, right? So if you're trying to be conversationally receptive in person and you're saying all the right words and phrases, it probably doesn't hurt to also nod and smile, right? Like sitting there sort of, you know, stony faced uh, is going to paint a very confusing picture for your counterpart. Um, but the other thing I would say is that I think body language is in some ways easier to fake. Um, and is because it's easier to fake, it's less informative. So for example, if you think about acknowledgement in conversational receptiveness, acknowledgement is almost impossible to fake because you know, if I haven't heard what you said, and if I haven't thought about what you said, it's really hard to then say, I understand that this is really important to you and therefore blah, 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 right? Like I can't effectively paraphrase what you said unless I actually heard you. Whereas, you know, I can nod and smile all day long and not actually pay attention to what you're saying. Um, so in, in that sense, I think conversational receptiveness is like a more honest signal of uh, what's going on in a person's head.